blistery Sunday God has given us, but there's snow on the ground. For that, we give thanks. We can give thanks for many other things, right? Go blue, lions king. Very good. We gather today, it is the second Sunday after Epiphany, which means in the season, God continues to be revealed to us, and we learn more about who God is. And today, the theme in worship will be called, that we, each and every one of us in this room, have been called by God to do something. For that, we will give thanks today. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as you're able, as we join together in the confession and forgiveness as found in your Lord. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another.
Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings.
my inmost heart. You need me together in my mother's womb. Come and see. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite any children with us this morning to come on board.
In Matthew and Mark, we find Jesus meeting the disciples. He invites them to come and follow him, and we read that they immediately leave their boats and follow him. In Luke, we get a little more story to that. Jesus tells the soon-to-be followers to try to let their nets down yet again. They resist as they have been fishing for some time and have caught nothing. But this time, their nets are filled, so much so that the boat is at risk of sinking. Luke then writes this. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. That simple. This morning in John, we see Jesus invite Philip with those simple words, follow me. And it seems he does just that. No matter which gospel we read this from, I find the call of the disciples to be amazingly puzzling. When I was younger, I wondered if these disciples had never learned the important childhood lesson of stranger danger. But today, I wonder how they just up and leave everything they know, everyone they love, all for this wanderer on the sea. We know that James and John dropped their nets to leave their father's ebony to feed and provide for their families. Simon Peter has a mother-in-law, so we must assume that he then has a wife, and perhaps children too. It doesn't make sense, but what we see is that these disciples are moved to follow. They are drawn to Jesus. They know that his presence, his love, his invitation will forever change their lives. Follow me, Jesus says. And they do. Immediately, without hesitation. In my relatively short time as a pastor, I could not count on my hands and toes, how fingers and toes, I guess, how many times I have heard people lament that their spouses, children, or grandchildren no longer go to church. We could pull this room and probably account for a good hundred plus people close to us who seem to have fallen away from the faith. This stands in stark contrast to what we see in our readings today when the early church is growing, when people were willing to risk their very lives to follow Jesus. It feels we are so far from that wildfire of faith in that day. And so I am asked, what can I do? How can I help them? How do I get them to come To me, it is almost helpful to reframe the question altogether. Perhaps it's not so much about bringing people to the church building as it is about helping people encounter the living Jesus in their own lives. I mean, look at our stories this morning. Samuel encounters God for the first time, and he is given challenging news. This is a critical moment in his life, and we read that he will go on to become a well-respected prophet. The disciples meet Jesus on the shore and everything changes for them. Their priorities, their vision for the world, their very lives. Nathaniel does hesitate for a moment. We see you, right? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He asks. And then he encounters the living God. One who knows him, who loves him, who meets him where he is, and who welcomes and invites him. We see again and again in Scripture that when people experience the love and mercy of our God, they are forever changed. Faith is ignited within them and they follow, not out of a sense of obligation, not because a parent or a family member prodded them, but because this has been made real has become tangible in their very lives. I share a story with you that I recall from my past, not because I always get it right, hear me say that, but because I can look back with gratitude that God put me in that place to make the love of the divine real in someone's life. 
that chapter of my life, I was an incredibly busy college student. Not sure I was even set for seminary just yet. I look back now and wonder how I was able to do as much as I was doing then. I was in school full time, working as the hiring manager of our local McDonald's, nearly full time. And I was heavily involved in my church, directing our choir and worship band, leading our media team and preaching at our contemporary services. Church wasn't something I talked about a lot, but people I worked with and went to school with knew it was an important part of my life. One co-worker, after getting to know me for some time, spoke with me about the trauma of losing her young daughter to accidental drowning. This was not something she talked about often. It was something that she grieved in her soul, as we could imagine. It was something she struggled to make sense of, especially as she considered God's role in it all. In that moment, the best I could do was to listen with care and share of a God who journeys to the cross, who knows grief and pain, who cries with her. I have no idea when she had last stepped foot in the church. I would imagine it had been at least a decade. But sometime after this discussion, she asked me about where I go, and she showed up more than once. Friends, I look back on this moment in my life, and I give thanks that God called me a young person with no pastoral or theological education to be in that place at that time. I give thanks that while a young, busy Michael could have missed that opportunity, I was led to that table, to that difficult discussion. Dear ones, what we hear throughout Scripture today is that all of us are called to do this work, to share with those around us how the love of God has made a difference in our lives, how it has met us, restored us, and filled us with hope and with love. There is no age requirement to do that. No credentials are needed. God has called you. God has equipped you for this task. Come, follow me, he says. It's true that it seems the flame of faith is burning dimmer these days. But what I know is that when the love of God is made tangible in the lives of others, a spark ignites. We can be a part of this through what we say and what we do. We are called to tell the story, to extend God's love, to share the light and hope that comes from Jesus, the infant in the manger, the son with whom God is well pleased, the one who died so that we might be forgiven and live eternal life. <coughs> St. Francis of Assisi is credited for saying, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. The Combermans read, read a similar sentiment in their books this week, right? You read it. Okay. Yes, of course I did, they said. It is our hands and feet that do the work of God, they read. Our voices that encourage others to respond to the Holy Spirit. Our actions that show the love of God to all people. This is how we acknowledge that what we do in this life matters, because we are a vital and necessary part of God's work. May we remember that we are called to be followers of Jesus in this place at this time. And may we remember that what we do, how we care for others, has the power to ignite that spark, to make faith burn bright. You are called, dear one. And this is good news. Come and follow me. Together, all God's people say. Amen.
council members and those serving in MSW use two and one? Uh, yes. following people have been elected by this congregation to positions of leadership. We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these siblings in Christ will lead us in our common life and our mutual mission as a congregation. So I will introduce the first one. So Mark White, wave your hand wildly. He serves as our council president, and he will go ahead and introduce all the others. Please, like, wave your hand loudly as you make this <laughs> All right, our vice president, Bill Kaufman. Our secretary, Cindy Rogers, is not here this morning. Sally McDonald is our chair for the Board of Ministry for Staff and Worship. She is enjoying time with family out in Oregon, is where she is at. But has zoomed in for two meetings this week already. Right right right. So yeah, she is connected. Yes. Uh, Dennis Smith serving his second year on the MSW board. Doug Vernier serving his first term, first year. Lynn Winsler, board of administration chair. John Smith, board of Christian education chair. Fred Russell, board of outreach chair. Karen McCormick. Board of Disciple Chair, Discipleship Chair. Bobby Joel Ferguson, our adult member at large. And last but not least, Ella Carlson, our youth member at large. That wasn't some really great waves, but no, that was a little That's right. A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us into one together with the Holy you are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support, so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are to be faithful in your specific area of serving, that the Spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith, active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, say, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I invite all of you to stand. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders? And will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? We will, and we ask God to help us. I now declare you installed as elected leaders of this congregation. Almighty God, bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace, that you may be faithful servants in Christ. Amen. So if these wonderful folks reach out and invite you to participate to further the kingdom of God, please prayerfully consider... And for their yes, we give thanks for the applause. Okay, we'll turn to your seats. Remember pictures after worship for all of you. Um, and we remain st standing for the prayers of intercession.
encourage the ministry and the mission of the church God of truth. Let the leaders of your church be trustworthy and accountable stewards. Let all its resources and outreach bring hope and healing to communities. God of grace, receive our prayer. prayer. Delight in the goodness of your creation, God the fig tree and flora of the soil. Heal areas of the world harmed by human greed. Restore those recovering from natural disaster. Protect our forests and waterways and all the creatures that live in them. God of grace, receive our prayer. Call the leaders of every neighborhood and nation to serve faithfully, God of wisdom. Give them a vision of justice and unity. Lead them to action that promotes equitable partnership and uplift those on the margins of society. God of grace, this is our prayer. Hold in your care any who suffer or struggle. You who know our inner hearts, be present with any who are oppressed, victim of racism or cultural bias, and all who long for respite or restoration, especially those we name now both silently and aloud.
school kits and the quilts and the collections that we've done for Luther Milberg. Um, yeah, they just shared a little video with us. So we'll watch that as we collect the offering.
sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
for God's beloved. Thanks be to God.